thank you, Siri. Uh, thank you, CFRI, for giving me the opportunity to do all this work and even present today. Um, it's been a great learning experience over the past two years, just being involved with the community and learning from everyone. Uh, today, I will be taking a deep dive into Pseudomonas. Um, this audience does not need any introduction to the bacteria, but what I'm going to hope to do is talk about the complexities that come with this bacteria, um, how it gets inside cells and how it could be a problem and probably end with some hope based on the hope for the horizon theme for this, because I think we have some exciting stuff to share. Um, all this work is done in Susie Fleisig's lab at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, it is the Department of Optometry, so I will be going across the theme of talking about how this bacteria is a problem for corneal infections and how that may also translate into infections in the lung, and there may be common themes and things to learn. Quite recently, uh, unfortunately, this bacteria was also a part in the news earlier this year where it was associated with an outbreak in artificial tears. It was found to be a contaminant in these tears that are used by people. There was a nationwide recall for the tears. And sadly, it, was also, it caused 81 patients to fall severely ill across 18 states in the country. And these are the most recent estimates from CDC. It was a rare strain of Pseudomonas that has not been detected in the United States. So uh, uh, we think it's coming from overseas. There were eight fatalities as of last reporting and 14 cases of permanent vision loss with people having eye and lung infections. It was quite intriguing to me and just looking at it where you see samples were recovered from the sputum, bronchial wash, tracheal aspirate, and parts of the eye, which are the cornea, vitreous, and then urine, which suggested that bacteria had somehow gotten from eye drops that people put in the eye into their lungs and then spread systemically. For somebody who doesn't think about it every day, just looking at the anatomy will give us some sense of how that is possible because there's this drainage system that goes from the eye into the back of your nose. So sometimes when you don't pinch the inside of your eye, when you're adding eye drops, you actually taste it at the back of your nose and back of your throat because it's actually draining through your nasal passage and then going there. So that's something. But the good thing is, um, CDC says that we have phages available for this particular strain of bacteria with IPATH and even at the Yale Center for Phage Therapy. So that's good. We've got this far in the past eight months. Um, I do want to mention that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is also all, almost often clumped together as a single group of bacteria that all act similarly, but have different levels of resistance. But in fact, there are actually two types of pseudomonas that may have very different pathologies and may have very different disease outcomes. And this was shown very early, sort of late 90s by Susie, where they, she showed that strains that express the toxin XOU, which is expressed by bacteria. So now bacteria produce the syringe-like apparatus that it uses to inject toxins from the bacteria into another cell. And when it injected exo U, uh, it caused this level of necrosis in the trachea of rabbits. Whereas when they were infected with strains that only expressed XOS, you could see that the cells are healthy and there were bacteria inside the cells over there. This alone suggested that there were, the strains of bacteria may have different pathologies associated with them. And then they also went on to show that when a strain of bacteria of Pseudomonas expressed exo U, it almost never expressed XOS. And when it expressed XOS, uh, it never expressed XOU. Now we know that the strains expressing XOU are more common in the corneal isolates, whereas the strains that express XOS are more common in CF isolates. There may be some overlap, but that's the distinction that we know of at this point. Here's a movie showing how they may be different. And on the left, I'm showing you the XOS, or what we call the invasive strain. And on the right is the XOU expressing strain. And what you can see is that the XOU expressing strain interacts with the cells, rapidly kills the cell where the cell loses all its architecture, similar to the necrosis I showed earlier. Whereas the XOS expressing strains are inside the cell membrane. You can see it inside the margin. They're happy, they replicate. And then the cell eventually dies because of an excessive amount of bacteria. 
In the past 10 years, we have shown that there may be specific mechanisms how this may be happening, but we are not, I won't be going into that now. So bringing it back to CF, this is what we know about the bacteria, but in the CF isolates that have been studied over the past many decades, what we know is that the type three secretion system or this syringe apparatus that I mentioned is down-regulated. So we do not, the strains don't seem to express the type three secretion system. And 59% of the isolates actually lose type three secretion system function. And this was nicely shown in these papers in 2010 and 2001. And the more I actually look at this data, I learn something new every time. Because if you see the first infection episode that somebody may have, they may have type three expression, but 50% of the strains will have this type three secretion system. That is, they're expressing the toxin, but the longer it prolongs, the type three secretion is down-regulated. And this is also shown over here where the duration of infection is inversely correlated with the expression of the type three secretion system. And we can study this in the lab because we know the regulator of the type three secretion system. And this is the regulator of the type three secretion system. And if you knock it out, you can shut off toxin expression. And what Susie showed late nineties is that if you take a toxin expressing strain, and here I'm specifically showing the XOU strain that kills the cell. If you remove EXSA, earlier you don't see any bacteria taken up into the cell, but then you start seeing bacteria taken up into the cell just by shutting off this toxin. So the consequence of toxin shutting off toxin expression may actually promote uptake into the cell. And here's a movie. And what we can see here is in both these things, so again, I'm showing an invasive strain and a cytotoxic strain, where you see if you shut off toxin expression, bacteria are now not spreading inside the cell, but they're localized into these vacuoles or subcellular compartments. And this is consistent between both types of strain. So if you turn off the type three secretion system, you may have similar localizations into the cell and they may be behaving similarly, but that's what I'm trying to figure out. So I cannot say that. Um, more recently, I've done this in normal epithelial cells and CF epithelial cells. And what, again, we can see in here, these are fluorescent images. And for the rest of the talk, this is, these are standard images. So all bacteria will be in green. This is the nucleus that is a cell. So this is a healthy cell from uh, the bronchial cell. And this is with the CFTR508 del cell lines, Kufi cells. And you see that there are more bacteria in vacuoles when you have this type three turned off in the CF cells relative to the bronchial cells. So jumping fast forward 25 years, and this is last year's paper that we published. And this was what was really exciting because for the first time, we had actually seen that a strain of bacteria that expressed XOS. So all the work that I'm going to present is going to be XOS, which is more common in CF strains. And what we showed is that when the same bacteria gets inside a cell, it may have two different gene expression patterns, which may relate to where the bacteria are inside the cell. So I'll go over this uh, again. Because here you're suggesting that, okay, the bacteria that are expressing genes that relate to the type three secretion system are filling the cell. Whereas bacteria that are expressing genes related to the biofilm are inside the vacuole. So this was quite exciting because earlier we could tease this apart by using mutants, but this was the first time we said, okay, we have a wild type infection and can we look at both populations? And we actually saw both populations happen inside the same cell. Um, we can quantify this and we can study the frequency of it. And what we found is that about, there's an equal distribution and about 6% of the infected cells actually had both populations inside the same cell. And to suggest that bacteria were diversifying in the repertoire, they were getting inside a cell, going to two different parts and having different gene expression. And this was very interesting because when we know that biofilm is a big problem when it comes to antibiotic therapy and toxin expression in cytosol inside the cell could have its own consequences. So the question that I was asking is that how does the intracellular lifestyle impact antibiotic therapy if these bacteria are expressing toxins? And before we really jump into that, the 
thing we need to acknowledge is that not all antibiotics can get inside a cell. A lot of the antibiotics we have are not cell permeable. And this is all the antibiotics over here, like amikacin, carbenicillin, tobramycin. And you'd see that only ciprofloxacin or the other RNA polymerase, rifampicin, are the ones that get inside a cell and may even be getting to the bacteria that are inside the cell. The way this assay works is that you see the same amount of bacteria and you'll be typically seeing this as MIC readings for any bacteria and it differs for the strain. So this is particular for this strain of bacteria that I'm working with and you would plate it across the different concentrations of antibiotic if let's say for amikacin, the bacteria would have stopped growing at four micrograms per mil. So you can see four micrograms per mil. And the way it's lower is better. So we wanted some, so what we were looking for is that we wanted something that went inside the cell and also had a lower MIC. Based on this, we chose ofloxacin to do the rest of the study. And I, I presented this last year, but I will not spend too much time on it. Uh, what we found is that the bacteria that expressed this toxin, and you can see that inside the cell, were cleared out. Uh, and this is a time-lapse image where I'm showing images one hour intervals, starting at four hours, going up to 24 hours. And you see that you can clear bacteria that express the toxin, but you don't clear bacteria that are expressing the biofilm, uh, no matter how high you go in the concentration of the antibiotic. This was great, but... It, was, it would have been more interesting to see both of them together because that was the discovery. So we used another tool to say, okay, now can we see all bacteria regardless of what genes they are expressing and can we then study the susceptibility to antibiotics? And there what we found was quite interesting that really started the other part of the project is that you could see cells that didn't express either of the genes, so not the toxin, not the biofilm, but they were still inside the cell. You did not see a reduction in the bacterial load in the cell, no matter how high you went. So even if you didn't express the toxin, you didn't express the biofilm, bacteria was still persisting inside the cell. So there may be something other than biofilms that may be causing the persistence that we were seeing. And, and really today's talk is focused on what are these other factors and really identifying those other factors. So again, to remind you, we're looking at the, trying to understand the population of this vacuolar population and really asking the question of what is this vacuole? Why, what are these bacteria? Why, where, where are they? Um, does it prevent the antibiotic? Like why are the bacteria surviving? Is it because we can give the antibiotic but it never gets to where the bacteria are? Or is it that the bacteria are doing something to actively respond and persist to this kind of antibiotic treatment? Um, and before we answer those questions, I just give a brief overview. So when Bacteria taken up into a cell, and, and this is a cell, it, it has a nice but very complicated way of getting to where it wants to go. But what it does is it starts from an endosome, goes to a late endosome. It'll be in this compartment, which we call the lysosome or LAMP3, um, LAMP3 marker. And what this is, is this is basically a digestive system of bacteria. It'll take a digestive system of the cell, sorry, not the bacteria. It's the system that is capable of taking bacteria, grinding it up into its components, and then having it either educate the cell or being used by the cell to do other things. So if a bacteria ends up here in the LAMP3 compartment, it's either destined to die or it's either destined to adapt. So that's what we wanted to know. And in 2013, we had published uh, this paper, another postdoc had published this paper where they showed that when cells were infected, you could track this LAMP3 compartment using a stain called lysotracker that goes to lysosomes. And then you could look, so green is bacteria, red is the stain, so you're looking for yellow. And you could see that the bacteria are in these compartments. It was assumed that these bacteria go on to die, but we, we found otherwise. And my question is that which vacuole really contains bacteria surviving the sofloxacin treatment? So using LAMP3 as a marker, then I go on, uh, went on to see whether there was any changes 
in co-localization, and you see without antibiotics, bacteria in these nice vacuolar compartments, and these are all CF cells. Uh, and when you add the concentration of antibiotics, the bacteria is still there expressing the GFP and then co-localizing, which suggests that they are in these lysosomes and they're alive. So the next question is, do these bacteria actually reach the vacuole? Do these antibiotics actually reach the vacuole? And we can do this quite neatly is because we have antibiotics that are fluorescent. So we can take these fluorescent antibiotics, put it in the cell, and you can see the cell margin quite nicely. We can use the same lyso tracker, which stains the lysosomes, and you can see the lysosomes here. And then you can do a co-localization analysis and plot the intensity profile across these, and you can see them overlap quite neatly, which suggests that the antibiotics are not only just getting into the cell, but they're also getting into the lysosome where the bacteria are. If we then ask the question, are surviving bacteria the, also seeing these antibiotics, but they may be getting into the lysosome, but the bacteria may still not be there. So we do the same thing, but this time look at co-localization of antibiotics and bacteria, and you can see that they are there, the antibiotic penetrates through the bacteria. So again, showing that it may be regardless of whether the bacteria are making biofilm or not, the antibiotics are getting there, the bacteria are surviving, and we'd like to know why they're surviving. Um, so with that, we sort of took, took, a, took a step back and then said, can, because to identify these, we'd either need to make a lot of gene reporters or we make to make a lot of mutants, but we wanted to know what's really happening. So we used a two-pronged approach where we said, okay, we're going to infect the cells, treat with the antibiotic, either use proteomics, which is to study all the proteins that are there, or study RNA-seq, which is to study all the genes that are there. And by combining this information, we can end up to a list of genes or targets that may be associated with bacteria that are surviving or give us some information about the host and what may be happening in there. So um, doing the same assay, we started off and looking at only RNA-seq data because it will be too complex to go into all the proteins. So only RNA-seq data, we see that on the right of here, you see all bacteria that are treated with ofloxacin. And there's, there may be differences between cell type, but you can see that at least ofloxacin treated bacteria are different from bacteria that are treated from untreated controls, um, which is interesting and exciting uh, because we're looking at a very small percentage of these populations and to be able to see that was quite encouraging. And then when you go on to look at only the genes that are down-regulated, and, and now I'm comparing the normal cells with the CF cells, you can see about 41 genes are common in genes that are down-regulated and about 38 genes that are commonly up-regulated in the surviving population. And we can do this nice kind of analysis, uh, which is called an enrichment analysis, and it puts together in context, okay, what could be happening inside a cell? And we see some very interesting results as we see that the entire type three secretion system that I showed you earlier is down-regulated in bacteria that are surviving antibiotics. Um, and also there's an increase in DNA damage um, related responses. Now, this is, this is interesting and it also fits because ofloxacin is a drug that causes DNA damage to the bacteria and that's how it kills the bacteria. And the fact that bacteria are responding to it by upregulating these genes that may overcome DNA damage is quite interesting. So you said, okay, that's, that's exciting, but could there be a common theme between what the bacteria are encountering and what's there in the host? So going back to the literature, uh, I was looking at polyamines because it's been shown in the CF literature that the CF lung actually has a high amount of polyamines in this, in this putum. And polyamines are well conserved across the domains of life. You find them in plants, bacteria, humans, and they're well conserved molecules to actually study. And what's really interesting is that they scavenge reactive oxygen species and they protect against DNA damage. And there's literature out there that shows that polyamines actually bind DNA 
and then protect the bacteria from DNA damage. And I was looking at uh, Pat Secor's work earlier, and that was quite interesting because the publication came up about polyamines and how they were protect from phage therapy. So that's quite interesting. It's known to regulate virulence for these other pathogens. And Pseudomonas has got two ways of actually bringing polyamines into its cell in addition to its own synthesis pathway. And what we found from our pilot data is that CF cells, bacteria from CF cells had increased expression of this particular transporter that brings polyamines into the bacteria. So we decided to focus on that and characterize that further. So the first step we took is, okay, we made, had transposon mutants in them, went on to see whether there was a reduction in the efficacy of the antibiotic, because that would suggest that they're involved. And what we found is the wild type had a MIC of four, so remember, low is better. So when you remove one of these genes, it reduces the MIC of the bacteria, which suggests that they could be involved in their persistence. And this is all in a dish. We're still not inside a cell. So it's all happening in a dish. We want to see whether they're important at all. And it seems like they're important. We look at to see whether they're bio, they form biofilms any better. Um, I mean, yeah, there's statistical difference, but I wouldn't say they're any different really in how they form biofilms. What was most interesting is that the other transporter that I didn't mention, there's been publications on that and they showed similar effects. So just track the black ones and you see that there's a slight increase in biofilms. But when you supplement it with a polyamine, you see this increase in biofilm formation over here. Well, we wanted to test that to see if our transporter is any different. And what we see is when we supplement with the same concentration of polyamines, you don't see this increase, which suggests that the pot mutants and the pot transporter may be different from this uh, other transporter that's been already studied. But then the obvious question is, are they more susceptible to antibiotics? And does it really matter when bacteria inside a cell? Because bacteria inside a cell may be very different from bacteria that are outside the cell. So we did some control experiments to make sure that the bacteria actually invade and they're inside the cell and the cells don't die any different at the time points we're looking. So they, no surprises there, that was good. And ultimately when we went on to do this experiment, I'm gonna spend some time here because this is important. We infected the cells and we treated with antibiotics. The concentration that we're using is actually sufficient, would have been sufficient to kill these bacteria, the mutants but not sufficient to kill the wild type. So we want to show this increased efficacy. So a lower dose of the antibiotic is sufficient to kill the mutants, All right? We're good there. So lower dose better, and it should not affect the wild type. And what we saw was that, so that that's also been quite exciting because that dose of the antibiotic is sufficient to kill this uh, the mutants, but not the wild type. So then, the obvious question is, is it because the changes in gene expression, are the bacteria doing something in their genes or are they just susceptible or are they changing localization? And the way we do that is use a previous assay where now we're looking at cells that have total bacteria that express the toxin. And if you look at the number of cells that have these bacteria, you see a slight increase, but nothing really uh, in like dramatic to explain the susceptibility of these mutants. And when, when you look at the biofilm gene expression, again, you see a slight increase just for this mutant, otherwise there's no changes in biofilm gene expression. This, though it's surprising, it's not different from what we've already shown, that biofilm gene expression and toxin gene expression is not what's making bacteria susceptible to this antibiotic. But when we do this assay, and here, yeah, this is the data that's similar, where you see that there was no difference in the wild type, no matter how much antibiotic you added. Now you increase the same concentration. You start seeing a reduction in the mutants as low as the MIC, which is 0.25 over here. And you can start seeing at 0.25, you start seeing reductions in the bacteria. Uh, now, this is what we started off to do. We wanted to know is there a way that we can reduce this particular bacterial load? And it suggests that the pot mutants could be actually involved in reducing this bacterial load and we can study these further. And this has been the most exciting bit of it because now we can say, okay, 
they are reducing, but is it because of changes in gene expression or is it because changes in localization? It seems like it's neither. And if we only count the number of vacuoles inside a cell, you can see that the wild type and mutants increase kind of similarly, but the mutants drop off almost instantaneously past the eight hour time point, whereas the mutant, the wild type seems to linger on in the vacuole. What also suggests now is that the mutants may have a fitness defect to survive in a vacuole relative to the wild type, and this is something we're pursuing further. Um, so in all, to conclude, I think acknowledging the differences in the strain types may be important for managing chronic infections because the strains may start off differently in the toxins they produce, but the right down regulation of EXSA may actually lead to the strains behaving similarly later. So I think that's something we need to acknowledge. Um, we need to understand this vacuolar population better so that we can lead to a generalized understanding of how pseudomonas infections and chronic infections develop. Um, it's possible that the responses to DNA damage may be one of the mechanisms that bacteria use. Um, and the involvement of pot transporters may be important for studying the, and understanding the persistence of bacteria and resistance to ofloxacin and overall fitness defects inside the cell. So with that, I would like to thank CFRA again for the support and uh, for, for the opportunity to present. Um, funding from the NIH. Uh, all this work would not have been possible with amazing lab members, uh, graduate student Eric, postdoc Daniel, uh, Noor, who helped with a lot of the CFU recovery studies and is now applying to med school. Um, and yeah, my PI and David and Susie. So thank you and take any questions.